Republican Kevin McCarthy won the role of Speaker of the House of Representatives in the U.S., but with serious divisions within the Republican Party, it was no easy win. So how will it manage the House over the next two years? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I am Hashim Ahalbarra. For the first time in more than 100 years, the United States was unable to elect a Speaker of the House in the first round. Kevin McCarthy had to make several concessions to win over hardline Republicans who voted against him in 15 rounds. It's a big deal in the US because the House was unable to move on to any other business, including swearing in members until the Speaker was elected. The House is the lower chamber of the Congress, and one of its important roles is to keep the president in check. Alan Fisher reports. After an historic wait, after leaking into a fifth day, after a night of drama and confrontation, it was 15th time lucky for Kevin McCarthy. The Californian Republican finally flipped enough votes to secure the position as Speaker of the US House of Representatives. As Speaker of the House, my ultimate responsibility is not to my party, my conference, or even our Congress. My responsibility, our responsibility, is to our country. He told everyone he had the votes to win on the 14th round. He didn't. Two votes of present. Gates. Gates essentially blocked his way to the chair as he fell short of the number of votes required by one. It led to incredible scenes on the House floor with the two being confronted by colleagues. Words were exchanged, fingers pointed and physical confrontation apparently avoided as one congressman had to be held back by colleagues. The conversations continued and suddenly a vote to adjourn to Monday was rejected. McCarthy wanted to go again. The scene summed up by one Democrat as he offered his party's nominee for the post. Madam Clerk, I rise to say, wow. <laughs> and then it was done. McCarthy finally became Speaker of the 118th Congress. Kevin McCarthy moved into the Speaker's office earlier this week, but several times in the chamber it looked premature. A group of ultra-conservatives blocked his elevation. But slowly he ground them down, offering a raft of concessions, including a change of rules in who could challenge the Speaker and the promise of seats on influential committees. Democrats congratulated McCarthy on his win, but warned he faces problems to control his own party. One Republican said the issues of the last few days will have no impact on his party's long-term prospects, the 2024 presidential election creeping ever closer. Uh, I think it's been hard on the party uh, and a little bit frustrating, but I don't think it's left a scar. I don't think it's anything permanent. And as I've said uh, a number of times as well, six months from now, no one will be thinking about this. And that could be an issue for Kevin McCarthy. He has an extensive agenda. He wants to push through Congress, but to do that, he needs a united party. And it has been anything but in the last few days and hours. Alan Fisher, Al Jazeera on Capitol Hill in Washington. Let's bring in our guest in Reston, Virginia, is Rena Shah, conservative political advisor and founder of Relax Strategies. Rena was a former senior advisor to Republican members of Congress in Baltimore, Maryland, is Jason Nichols, progressive political analyst and senior lecturer at the University of Maryland, College Park in Colchester in the United Kingdom, is Natasha Lindstadt, U.S. political analyst and deputy dean of education at the University of Essex. Welcome to the program. Rena. the speakership crisis now is over. The arm twisting came to an end. How would you characterize the whole episode? The entire episode was a total embarrassment for the Republican Party. And anyone with eyes can see that. When they've stumbled right out of the gate, that's a foreshadowing for what's to come. This chaos, this disagreement, uh, this is just a, a real tale of how much infighting there is in today's Republican Party, and it's not going to stop anytime soon. Jason, four days of defeats, 14 failed attempts for Kevin McCarthy. 
backroom dealings managed to salvage what he had to achieve finally. But is this something that would haunt him for the remainder of his tenure as a speaker? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, he's almost speaker in name only. He, he has much less power than other speakers. He had to make major concessions. And the interesting thing is that there's really very little ideological room between him and some of the hardliners that were upset with him. But it's going to make his job very difficult moving forward, uh, raising the debt ceiling, uh, funding the government, things that we expect the speaker to be able to do uh, with his majority. He's going to have a very difficult time corralling some of those hardline right wing uh, people that he has in his caucus. And mm -hmm. he has much less power because of the rules concessions that he made. Natasha, historically, when you cut a deal, it's mostly behind closed doors. This time, the fact that cameras were catching every single aspect of this whole saga, the fight for speakership, are we into an uncharted territory or a new political landscape in the US? Uh, that's, that's a good question. I mean, we definitely have never seen anything uh, like this that was such a, a spectacle. And of course, viewers were uh, glued to, to their, their screens about this. We never seen uh, lawmakers almost like a fist fight almost broke out where people were having to be held back. Uh, and some of this is because Kevin McCarthy decided to put this to a vote before he knew that he had the votes. Normally you don't do this, but he was so obsessed with becoming the next speaker and willing to give up pretty much everything uh, to do so uh, that he went through these, you know, 14, 15 humiliating rounds of of not getting to it. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a little bit the effect of Trumpism and how it's infected the party, that you don't have policies that, that people care about as much anymore. It's more about your own persona, creating your own brand, attracting more media attention. Uh, and because of that, there wasn't much party discipline. And we see that then things kind of played out in a very personalistic way, amateurish way, on the floor as it did. Mm -hmm. Rina, is this an indication that the Republican Party is never going to be the same again? Because when you look at the optics of this whole fight for the speakership, you can see Kevin McCarthy walking his own way, trying to convince two or three members of the ultra-conservative flank of the Republican Party just for the sake of securing the position. Where are we going now with the Republican Party? Well, the dynamic here that's at play now that this past week is over and we do have a speaker, it's quite complex and it can't be distilled down to one or two things. Uh, certainly the impact of former President Trump and the fact that he's also announced a 2024 bid already, that plays a real major role here. But what we saw also this week is that his endorsement of McCarthy really didn't mean much, uh, particularly to those six final holdouts who ended up voting present oh to give McCarthy the speakership. Mm -hmm. It's important to note that these people say they want to drain the swamp. They want to break the establishment. And they consider McCarthy and McConnell, even in the Senate, uh, to be part of Washington's old school. And what they've really done by taking on the veneer of Trump is given a throwback to his 2016 first bid for the White House mm -hmm. and said that you don't have to be an establishment figure in order to win. We can appease the American people, our Republican base, by breaking these people that have been in Washington for so long. But the, uh, the great irony here is that their demands were so Washingtonian in nature. They mm -hmm. wanted committee assignments. They wanted the ability to change the process of the rules and have not just an outsized uh, influence, but a really loud lasting impact on how the GOP conducts itself in the legislative chambers from the ends forward. We've never seen anything like it in modern history. We've seen this typically happen in the Republican National Committee and the party structure, never within the halls of Congress has it has the tension come to the surface in this way. And that makes mm. it extremely difficult for McCarthy to remain speaker these next two years. Jason, let's, let's try and uh, break down exactly what happened between Kevin McCarthy and the dissidents. So he has given them concessions, particularly when it comes to the spending bills and the funding of the government and the financing of the federal department. Now, is this an indication that we are not likely to see any bipartisan deal in the near future if suddenly the speaker himself is beholden to a bunch of ultra-conservative people who are determined just to do 
anything that goes against the very spirit of the, what the Democrats stand for. You know, Hassan, I, I hold out hope that there will be some moderates who will uh, cross that line and want to work with Democrats in order to get things done for the American people, that want to actually see things other than, you know, uh, these kind of spasms that the, uh, that the far right are having, that they want to just investigate Hunter Biden and, and look at his laptop and talk about the origins of COVID, which we'll probably never know because we don't have the cooperation of the Chinese. All of these kinds of things um, are kind of the red meat things that the right wants to do. But I think that there are some moderate Republicans who actually want to get work done, who actually want to legislate, who actually want to actually deliver for their constituents and deliver for the American people. And I think that there, if we can get, of course, you know, because of the historic underperformance of Republicans in the midterms, we only need a few of them to cross the line, to actually be willing to vote with uh, Democrats in order to get legislation through to the Senate, where, mm -hmm. of course, uh, Democrats have a slim majority, and get it to potentially get it to uh, President Biden's desk. And even Mitch McConnell, when we're talking about the border, Mitch McConnell in, in the Senate has said that he wants to work with President Biden and with the White House. So I, I have a little bit of hope that we are not being held hostage by Matt Gates and uh, Lauren Boebert, that there are people in this chamber on the right that actually want to do the right thing. Natasha, this has been the most contentious ballot for the speaker since before the Civil War. And what we've seen for, is, is just quite interesting how personal agendas were prevailing over the very agendas of the country itself. Are we likely to see uh, a sea change as far as the political landscape in the US is concerned? Well, I mean, that's been one of my biggest concerns that, you know, US democracy is faltering, our institutions are, are uh, have been weakened, and uh, we, we see that personalism ha has been uh, one of the more salient um, residues of, of the Trump era. You see, the political parties, you know, political parties are so important for democracies to function, and, and they have to have some level of party discipline. We see what was on display. It was just all about these personalities. And, and they weren't really thinking about governing and acts of service and being representative. They were just thinking about themselves. They seem to have this unrelenting quest for their own fame and, and power uh, and, and attention. And they were lapping it up, all the media attention that they were getting. And, and you know the the differences, the actual mm -hmm. ideological differences between Matt Gates and Kevin McCarthy don't seem to be that obvious. So what on earth were they fighting for? Why were they going putting us through this huge charade? And I think one of the issues that I'm really concerned about is that we're we're seeing party discipline and party institutionalization, particularly on the Republican side, just falling apart. Uh, and we need two functioning parties. To, to have a functioning democracy. Uh, so I'm a little bit more pessimistic about mm -hmm. what's gonna happen here, but I'm hoping that the Republican party gets it together and goes back to the core values that they once had, and then we have a more of a normal two-party system. Reina, we know how quite significant is the role of a Speaker of Congress. Now, when, when it comes to Kevin McCarthy, are we expecting a change in terms of style and substance, particularly as you know, both Republicans and the Democrats have been saying it's about time to decentralize the office itself? Well, I think uh, those shared attitudes about really decentralizing that power of the speaker speaks to a number of issues we've seen in the modern era that even go back to Newt Gingrich, the, the Republican who so famously still gives his opinion these days on Trump and, and what the GOP should do. Uh, I think, you know, look, there's there's a real s a distinction here between uh, Gates and McCarthy in this way. And people think that they are so ideologically centered. But some of the floor speeches I heard this past week actually this past week actually told me otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I found myself agreeing with some of what Gates was saying. Um, he is not too far off from being a millennial as well, like I am. And millennials are people born after 1981. Uh, as I've talked to millennial Republicans over the years, I found that their attitudes have changed about certain matters that uh, typically have been thought to be 
uh, values held by the left. Uh, things like the influence of big money in uh, political campaigns, uh, you know, the Supreme Court decision, Citizens United. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're seeing even suburban Republican young mothers change their attitudes about abortion and reproductive access. That was a banner year in that way this past year. What I heard from Gates this past week was talking special interests. And he feels that McCarthy and his ilk are going to continue to cater to the special interests in Washington. Mm -hmm. And that is a great frustration. And they're not thinking of the sort of younger, um, excuse me, uh, of the rural blue collar people that actually did vote for Trump in many ways. The Republican Party has a number of problems. They're losing younger voters. They're losing uh, educated younger women, mothers, and even new American demographics, such as immigrants uh, from our southern borders or even from the Middle East and Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a problem as well. But at the same time, they've got to put forward a policy agenda that speaks to these people, okay. things that center on economy, immigration, and energy. I think that will serve them well, and that will show why this fighting was so tense if they're able to legislate in those three key areas. Jason, how much more difficult does it make Biden's uh, job working with the uh, Republicans, with their slim majority? Uh, I, I really don't think it makes it any more uh, difficult. Uh, I, I slightly disagree with, with uh, Rena that there's a, a big gap between McCarthy and, and Gates. Gates, whose father's worth $500 million. Uh, they, they like special interests, too. They like big donors, too. Uh, I, I do think that there is... <clears throat> that uh, there is uh, a little bit of a, 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 a change in the Republican Party, but a lot of those changes aren't necessarily positive, and I don't think that this is necessarily going to get them more attention from those newer demographics uh, that Rena referenced. I, mm -hmm. I don't think that, you know, shutting the government down or, or refusing to fund the government or, uh, you know, these endless investigations that don't really lead anywhere are, are going to actually help them to uh, widen their base. And I agree that a lot of the uh, the rural voters and and uh, some of these disaffected groups have legitimate gripes, but we saw none of that being mm -hmm. addressed by Trumpism or by the Trump administration. And so going that hard, hard right uh, way hasn't really worked for anyone. I think that this is this just put everything in disarray, kept us without a government for several days, and it mm -hmm. wasn't a positive thing for the Republicans or for the United States of America. Natasha, Everyone now will remember for quite some time the photo of Marjorie Taylor Greene with her phone displaying the initials of Donald Trump, DT. Now, do you think that his shadow was quite there during the whole procedure? Do you think that this is someone who will definitely shape the future of the Republican Party and the future of the political landscape in the US? I think he is still playing a huge role in the Republican Party, whether some of the elites in the Republican Party want to admit it or not. It's true that he wasn't really able to convince those six holdouts to change their mind uh, and that he was blamed across the media for the poor showing of the Republicans in the 22 midterms. Uh, but he still has a hold over the Republican Party to some extent. Mm -hmm. And they are going to really need to uh, completely push out Trumpism if they want to get back to winning elections, because they, they can't with him still a big part of this party. They mm -hmm. haven't really addressed January 6th and all of the activities that he's been involved in that have gotten him in trouble with the, with the law, you mm -hmm. know, from... Uh, all the different types of fraud uh, and, and so on. They have decided to make a deal with the devil, so to speak, because they think that's going to bring out votes for him. I have a few. Um, and mm -hmm. they've really lost their soul in doing so, and he's still there. And I think that's something that the elites are going to have to really address uh, if they ha want to have any chance in doing okay. well in the 2024 elections. I have a few other angles I would like to cover uh, uh, with you. Rina, now, when it comes to economy, border security, which are top on the agenda of the Republicans, particularly the ultra-conservatives. How do you see them unfolding in the upcoming weeks and months? 
Well, I must say, you know, I, I do think there's a tremendous opportunity for moderate Republicans to really st put their foot down and say, we want to legislate. We, you know, we don't want to continue to do all these political witch hunts through Congress. They, I mean, they say Democrats did it in the last Congress, but they forget that Democrats mm -hmm. were hugely successful in passing so much landmark legislation. Uh, again, I think it'll be up to moderate Republicans that are that have waned in number, to be honest. I mean, let's just be frank about the numbers here uh, prior to the midterms. But now they because of the midterm results, they are emboldened and they can grab the mantle and say, let's come up with a, a sensible solution to our broken immigration system. One thing that is rarely talked about is the number of visa overstays here in the United States. That is a huge contributor. It's not the people at the southern border as much as it is the people who are overstaying their visas. Nobody ever talks about that in a responsible manner. Okay. People talk about a physical wall that Trump never built. I would love to hear more cybersecurity, technological innovations that would help us do better in that manner. And I think Republicans can do this, but again, they can get, they'll get in the way of themselves. And okay. this past week didn't give me that much hope. Jason, when you look at the way the uh, Congress uh, will operate in the future, now the Republicans have control over the Congress, the Democrats still control the Senate and the uh, White House. Could, could this be on its own conducive to one final outcome, which is wise people from the Democrats, from the Republicans will have to come get together for them to move forward? <clears throat> well, I think that's that's going to be key for the for the future of the country is people coming together. Uh, and, and certainly for us to, as as uh, your previous guest, as Rena just stated, like getting Republicans to actually want to legislate, to actually want to solve problems, to actually come over and talk about things like immigration. We saw the president has already laid out a uh, plan from an executive perspective, but we need comprehensive immigration reform. And that's something that only Congress can do. And this is a problem that's been around for three decades. These, these are things that Republicans can actually make happen. It's actually the ball is in their court. And I think the American people are starting to get wise to the idea that this is up to Republicans uh, to either, they can either obstruct or they can legislate. And I think mm -hmm. the American people want legislation. I think that there are some Republicans, I still hold out hope, that actually want to solve problems, that actually want to negotiate with President Biden and uh, send things up to the Senate mm -hmm. to, to get things done. Natasha, one of the key concessions given by McCarthy to the dissidents was allowing a single lawmaker to force a vote that would oust the speaker, which means that he will end up being very vulnerable to the ultra conservatives. Could, how can the Congress then get over this chaotic start? I mean, that's one of the things that I'm actually very worried about. If you have one person that can file a motion to vacate the speaker, uh, we saw what damage six people could do. What's to say that this is not going to happen within the next two years, particularly because it seems like there's some sort of personal vendetta against McCarthy. If he does something that they don't like, they can uh, decide to, to get rid of him. And that was one of the things that they were trying to champion. They were trying to basically deinstitutionalize and weaken our legislature, which of course is bad for democracy. For their own gain. It mm -hmm. wasn't really clear what we were gaining by changing these rules, other than to, to elevate their, their own status. Well, let's see how it goes and let's see what happens in uh, two years from now. Rena Shah, Jason Nichols, Natasha Linstadt, I really appreciate your, your insight. Thank you. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com, for further discussion. Go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashim Ahalbara, and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.